Thank you, everyone. Um, it is so nice to be here. I, um, as Dave said, the second that I heard more and more about Tugboat, I became incredibly intrigued. Um, and I thought I would start off with a story about my past and my family's business um, because it inspires me to this day. Uh, you're wondering what that has to do with the movie business, but that is my father with Miss America and her court. And where this came from is my grandfather in the 20s had a company or started a company called Catalina Swimwear. And as it grew more successful, he, um, of course, started to think, how am I going to market this to this bigger and bigger audience? And there was a little competition called the Miss America pageant that a group of gentlemen created to promote Atlantic City. So he joined forces with the Miss America contest in the 30s, and it began to obviously um, explode as a pageant, as well as Catalina Swimwear became increasingly successful because if you look back at the photographs until the early 50s, there's a little sailfish on every single contestant's swimsuit. It inspires me because that's a brilliant story. It's so simple. The best stories are so simple. But then adversity struck always when you don't least expect it. In 1951, one of the contestants refused to wear the swimsuit in photographs, which was the whole point of doing it. Sorry, it wasn't one of the contestants. It was Miss America that refused. So he said, fine. And the next year, he had already started Miss USA and Miss Universe. Everybody had Catalina swimwear on with the little fish. And I think about that because I feel like he stayed true to the spine of his story. He didn't forget what his goals were, and he stayed on compass. And so when Miss America wouldn't wear the suit, it's like, well, why don't we just have Miss Universe? Um, which kind of explains a lot about my daily um, business, too. We, we deal with a lot of adversity in producing, creating movies. Um, I thought I'd just briefly say what I do, which is both in my life as an executive and in my life as a producer. I've done both about 20 years apiece. I look for story that I think has the potential to become a movie. Then I develop the story in terms of getting a screenplay. Stories have come from books. Driving Miss Daisy was a play. Articles, 60 minutes. You know, you kind of walk around looking for stories to make into movies. Um, and then once I have a screenplay, which sometimes, you know, it can take two years to get a great script. The first writer may have to do eight drafts, or maybe they don't quite get it to cross the finish, finish line so you find somebody else to finish it. Then I package it, find the director, the actors. I do a budget. Then I go out and I sell my heart out to try to get financing to make my movie. Um, once I get the financing, then I'm responsible for the financial elements of making a movie as well as the creative elements. And by that, I mean that the movie reaches the potential that was exhibited in the script. And I find like that is one of the greatest blessings of my life is because I develop the story, I can really keep my beeper on what I felt reading the screenplay has to ultimately end up on the big screen. So that's a tussle during filming a movie because you've got 200 people working and you've got the vagaries of weather. Um, but you just keep looking two steps ahead and make it through. Um, yeah, most of, I've always made it through. Uh, and then the marketing of the movie, you work with the studios in marketing your movie. But I'll talk about the development and the story part a little bit more in a second. Um, just quickly, Dave mentioned that I have worked at a number of studios. And I look back and I realize I failed upward for quite some time. Then I did OK, but not my best in trying to do it like everybody else. And 
play to the collective that surrounded me at these different studios and corporations. And when I finally learned to see the world as I see it and realize I can only see the world as I see it, um, meaning that I would see movies that many people didn't see, like Driving Miss Daisy, when I finally learned to trust that, um, I started to make better and better movies. But there's a caveat to that. Um, this is my, one of my favorite quotes. People sensing my belief wanted some of that belief for themselves. Belief, I decided, belief is irresistible. Mr. Nike. Um, it's so important in my business to pursue what you truly believe because at a certain point, I have to sell my idea. And what I'm selling is a single product issuance. Many times, millions and millions of dollars have to be invested. You don't get to test market it because you can't really test market until the movie's done. You can't test market a script. So I discovered, whether I was an executive or as a producer, that if I truly believed in the potential of this story and harnessed kind of the lowest common denominator, or not the lowest, the common denominator within myself of why I thought this would be a good movie for a lot of people, staying that place, I could get people to eventually come along with me. Even if they didn't completely see it, they could feel how much I believed. So, whether I would be convincing my colleagues or ultimately selling it to an audience. It's believing and being able to articulate that belief, which to me is one of the biggest parts of my job. Um, story. I have nothing unless I have a story, a screenplay. And Again, I can only make movies that I see and feel. If I try to develop a movie that somebody else sees and feels, which could be a spectacular idea, if I don't feel it, there's lots of traps ahead of me. One trap is being able to develop the story. I could tell you the story in two minutes, but I need to have a narrative that takes you through an entertaining experience. That is a huge part of my job. I mean, I'm, I'm making entertainment. If, uh, if whether you watch it on your couch or go to the theater, um, I can have it be as depthful as possible, but if it's not entertaining, I haven't really done my job. Um, I'm a huge believer in archetypal storytelling, which Jung and um, Joseph Campbell talked about one of the simplest ways that I explain it to myself and others is that it's about patterns of the human condition. That an archetypal character represents a pattern of human behavior. And so I don't always understand why I'm suggesting this idea or that idea, but I have this. Um, I guess thing that I've developed within myself is I go to my humanity, my, my commonness with mankind in developing scene by scene how a character or characters will live through my story. The other part of it is ultimately I'm going to have to bring along a crew and director into the world of this story. And so I need to feel it and be able to articulate it way beyond just the writer and I figuring it out. So Sully, I wanted to just tell a quick story. I didn't know you were going to bring Sully up. But um, this is an example of how I develop material. So Sully wrote a book called Highest Duty. We read the book, and it's a lovely telling of Sully's life, ending with this wonderful, incredible, miraculous event. So I read the book, and I'm like, well, I don't know that P 
people are going to want to see this as a movie because the event just happened last year. They know what's going to happen. They know the end. And my partner at the time, um, Kip, said, well, maybe we should just go meet Sully. So we, up we go to Danville, California. And within 20 minutes of being in Sully's house, he says, you know, it wasn't until six weeks ago that I didn't know this was all going to be taken away. And he meant the celebration of his heroism. And being the brat that I am, I'm like, come on, Sully. You are the guy. I mean, how would it ever be taken away? And he proceeds to talk about the NTSB investigation. And up until six weeks before we saw him, he seriously thought his pilot's license was going to be taken away. He was put through, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, he was put through a very grueling um, interrogation by the NTSB. And I thought, OK, that is the architecture of a movie. That is conflict, heroes overcoming conflict, things that people never knew with a heck of an ending. So we developed the screenplay with Sully. It took a while to get it made because everybody thought they knew the story. Well, we know the story of Sully, so why is that a movie? And that goes back to you got to believe it because I just kept standing on rooftops yelling, this is a movie. Um, and then finally was smart enough to send it to Clint, and within four months we're in pre-production. So that was a miracle too. Miracle for me. Um, one of the things I was mentioning earlier is obviously I'm a bit more of an out-of-the-box thinker. And that's just something that I guess just naturally I'm a, I'm a maverick. My poor mother, I'm a maverick. But you need to have people help you not only execute your ideas, but also help you make your ideas better. So I always surround myself with people that are smarter than me, see things differently than me, um, challenge me. It's easier, and we're tempted to hire people that look like us, talk like us, um, don't argue around the table. But over time, the experience of working with people totally different than me, that are different than me, um, it makes me, the project, the process, um, so much better. And another thing for me that um, has been invaluable is I travel a lot. And I traveled since I was a little kid. Um, and I very much enjoyed taking my son on travels around the world because it, it kind of helps you get out of your own way. You, you're allowed to see yourself and to see the world through multiple prisms. And um, I think it's important that we get ourselves outside of our comfort zones. So I took my son to China, and he was miserable because it was so foreign. But taking us out of our comfort zones was like an incredible growth, period of growth for both of us. He's a Gen Z guy, too. Um, just a quick mo This is a movie that I just finished. And it's just a quick um, expression of, it's called Land, Robin Wright starred and directed. And I insisted that we shoot this build our set and shoot this at 8,000 feet and on top of this mountain. Everybody told me I was crazy, but Robin said, OK, I'm going to go along with you. Um, so we had horrific weather. We, had, we were shut down by 75 mile an hour winds. We had four feet of d snow dumped. And some of my other production guys were like, yeah, see, we told you not to build up here. But when we showed the movie this last Sunday, this last Sunday at the Sundance Film Festival, um, the thing that was discussed over and over and over again is how real and authentic the movie felt. And the experience of the actor in that circumstance felt so real. Well, it was real. We were living it. Um, but it just was a reminder. Like, nature was a character in our movie, and the smartest thing we did was put ourselves through a survival course shooting it to capture beauty like that. Um, because it's what people really appreciate in the movie alongside this great story and amazing actress. Seeing future thinking, um, an extension of seeing things out of the box, I think it's really important that we give ourselves time to reflect. It's like thinking inside while seeing outside. 
And I've learned over years that it's vital that I just close my door and go to my sense of the world, what's coming at me, what do I believe? Because the future, if you're trying to think about the future, it normally isn't, you're not lucky enough that you're just connecting dots. Um, sometimes seeing out there is scary because it doesn't look like anything that you're experiencing right now. So with studios, studios refused to look at piracy as a problem. No, nope, it's not gonna be a problem. Well, by the time they figured out that piracy was a contagion, they lost billions and billions of dollars around the world, and they continue to lose billions. Same thing with streaming. Um, studios for a long time poo-pooed streaming. Nope, we're only gonna be doing theaters. Nobody's gonna wanna be watching movies on their couch, blah, blah, blah. Um, and those that didn't embrace streaming early on, which is really in the last five years, um, they will go under, they'll get bought because you can't make your numbers work. And even though COVID accelerated this change, um, it was coming anyway. So I just say again that it's so important to be able to see beyond where you are. And the same thing with stories. I, I, it doesn't do me any good to do a story that already was done. I need to be gutsy enough to do a story that's never been done. And then um, believe in its future. Believe in its success. I'm gonna make sure I have time. Um, I just wanna end with the fact that everyone thinks that making movies um, is like going to Las Vegas, you roll the dice. But I feel the opposite, is that if you anchor yourself in a story that connects with humanity, and for me that means it's gotta connect here in my solar plexus. You're true to what that is, true to the vision of it, which is why I go back to my grandfather. He was true to what he saw. He's like, fine, okay, I'm gonna make something else up, Miss America, Miss Universe. Um, if you're true to it, you make it for the right price so that you are risk appropriate. And I guess make sure you execute it to a high excellence. You're gonna have a movie that will make some money. Um, and that's, you can prove that out over and over again. But there's something else going on which will be interesting to see how it um, transpires for all of us. A lot of these different um, organizations, Netflix, Apple, whatever, they are huge believers in algorithms. So the algorithm says make this kind of movie and the algorithm, which I, I'm sure it has its place. Like I, I've always lived by, yes, I have my instincts, but it has to connect with knowledge and facts. So I don't run out into the world and, you know, with some crazy vision that I had. I, I try to use the accumulation of intuition, knowledge, and facts. But it's so scary to invest in movies and Again, single product issuance, millions of dollars. It feels safer to go to an algorithm. But looking at Netflix's biggest hit last year, which was The Queen's Gambit about a young woman, if you haven't seen it, who takes on the world's chess masters, there is no way an algorithm would have predicted that that would be Netflix's most successful show. Um, there's no way an algorithm would have predicted that Star Wars would become what it became. So again, I think metrics are important. When I test market a movie, how people experience, experience it and those metrics, they're important to me and I will alter the cut of the movie um, to suit that. But I feel like going into a dark room or sitting even on your couch, movies or products, if, it, if they come from a place of your humanity, I don't believe there's an algorithm that can tell you what your humanity is. So as things become more mechanized and, and maybe AI can do it, I don't know. Um, but I believe that I can feel when my humanity is touched by something. And I hope that I'm able to continue to make movies where I trigger the humanity in somebody else. Oh, I have 11 seconds. All right, I have one last quote in my 11 seconds, I'll say. 
My last quote is, which has been a guiding light for me, when I, be, when I went from being an executive to being a producer, which meant that I was on the set every day producing movies, which is my passion. Uh, there was a quote that Jackson Pollock said, which is, hopefully, if you feel something while, you, while you're doing it, painting, others will feel something when they see it, painting. And I discovered over the years that if I really feel something while I'm getting the script done or making the movie, that somebody in Des Moines is going to feel exactly the same. That's the common humanity. <laughs>